good morning good afternoon good evening depending on wherever you are logging in from uh, at least i have the panel which is truly global so a very good morning to you sean and uh, good morning to you sajesh and uh, good afternoon good evening to everyone else so uh, it's really a pleasure to be amongst the stalwarts of uh, these key leaders representing a varied section of industry and the kind of experiences that they bring to the table uh, you would have read their introductions uh, already but as we go along we will uh, recap that uh, in in very brief words uh, ours is supposed to be a fireside chat which by very nature means that we will keep it a little light and informal we have had some fantastic sessions starting with ravi's keynote address and the cxo's panel that uh, rakesh so uh, ably facilitated just now and we got a uh, uh, lot of uh, 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 nuggets of wisdom from them uh, the fireside chat i want to follow is a little bit more uh, on the informal but not casual way okay so let me just begin with a little bit personal uh, uh, experience to try and connect with the theme of this session which says using turbulence to achieve escape velocity very interesting in fact in good old days i used to enjoy air, air turbulence i seriously honestly make this statement that i actually enjoyed air turbulence it gave that extra kick and fun while flying like a roller coaster but then that stopped because i got married ever since then i only pray when that turbulence happens and nothing else and i know that at least 70 80% of my co-passengers would be in something similar mode depending on the intensity of the turbulence and loss but here we are talking of turbulence as a metaphor in a business context in the middle of an industry which has actually grown out of creating major turbulences themselves so using turbulence is going to be definitely a new normal for us responding to dealing with it we have learned we have heard we have watched we have witnessed we have heard all the stories how we have responded as an industry to that so we have responded to the industry to the turbulence but is that good enough obviously not the kind of uh, next normal that we are kind of uh, anticipating many of us have better idea many of us have don't so good good idea nobody can uh, be perfect in estimating it in visualizing it but having responded to whatever we faced with in the last one year or so now is the time to actually uh, make most out of this crisis as the famous saying of sir winston churchill goes that never let a crisis go waste so we will try and learn from the wisdom of all the fellow panelists on what next how to deal with it so i would uh, i have got a few questions from my own side and i would encourage all of the members of the audience to feel free and use the q and a uh, mechanism functionality of zoom to pose whatever questions that come up to your mind but i would uh, take my own shot at it and turn to guess who i will start with ladies first so shalini here is one for you uh, of course we belong to an industry which is takes pride in being totally gender agnostic but we are also part of a society Uh, where we follow certain cultural norms and ethos so here it goes for you shalini and uh, importantly uh, you would have all noted that shalini does not represent only as an organization she is uh, part of uh, kpmg uh, and all that you would have read but more importantly she deals with an important segment of the business that we are all part of 
which is popularly currently known as GCC's Global Capability Center. So from that perspective, my question to you, Shalini, would be that how has this particular segment, GCCs as a whole, have responded to the turbulence and moved beyond that? In fact, if I were to rephrase this question, many of the GCCs are already at a certain level of maturity. In fact, uh, I, uh, from my perspective, I was there uh, 25 years ago when this all started, but the maximum GCCs would be probably 15 years, 18 years, 20 years old in uh, their journey of this consolidation transformation through global business services. So uh, if we were to reimagine this entire concept in the light of today's norms, how would they have created the entire roadmap blueprint for the GCCs. Any thoughts? Thank you, Anand, for the question. And thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> I'm not sure going first is uh, purely for the reasons you described. It's it's nice to get a chance to open this. Uh, and, and before I say anything else, a big, a big thank you to the Shared Services Forum for the opportunity. Looking forward to this chat with the co-panelists here today. Uh, I must caveat by saying the term global capability centers, as we all have come to use it uh, as a matter of convenience, this acronym, uh, to be honest, I, I do believe there may be a problem with that term itself, because GCCs by definition, if viewed in that manner, tend to uh, construe different implications of what a center could mean. You know, the whole concept of one sitting in a center has connotations of being it being remote. It tends to bring this perspective of onshore, offshore. And I do believe if anything in the last uh, 10 months through the pandemic, this whole construct or the way one is viewing it globally, the concept of a center is soon diminishing uh, because what one is really seeing on the back of technology that has been at the core of driving changes through the pandemic, we have accelerated the journey for our business ecosystem to, to evolve uh, and crunch timelines where, I know there are various reports that talk about it to say crunch timelines by five years, potentially, just in terms of technology adoption and embedding it into our ecosystem. So if you look at it from that perspective uh, and you look at the business value chain, the concept of a center really does not mean as much anymore. It's really about how seamlessly capability hubs across the globe are plugging in to deliver value by looking at an end-to-end -end, uh, value chain. So, uh, so Anand, that would be my first opening comment to say that I do believe that the, uh, the definition of how one sees this and how one has seen from the old days, I, I was listening in on the previous panel, from what one started off with IT-enabled services to looking at where we've come on to, you know, many terms used, but I think increasingly we have truly blurred geographical boundaries. Uh, the current scalable hybrid virtual model is evidence of, of that. And of course, one has proven resilience with working in this environment over the last 10 months, most effectively and smoothly. So uh, I do believe at a, as a concept, I think that itself has changed. Uh, by definition, hence, when you look at end-to-end -end, uh, integration across platforms, across the value chain, the, the whole idea of work placement also has changed. So what one has seen, and India here on the back of some fantastic talent and leveraging that demographic dividend has been able to really help uh, organizations further invest into these technology hubs, into the digital hubs, as one may call it, uh, which is then going across that value chain to drive some very, very transformational stuff. The days of talking of IT, finance, HR, the concept of back office, I think is, is behind us. It's kind of, some of that is a given. Uh, what we're talking about now is really impacting across that value chain, the front of the front office. How are you looking at truly making the most of this technology lever of using data as a pivot to impact end outcome for the business, the end customer experience. So one is seeing some, has seen some very significant shifts as you will hear some of our co-panelists, I'm sure sharing their experiences. 
specific experiences. I think just the concept of the model has changed and this model is evolving even faster. I'll spend just another 30 seconds to say that it's not just about these capability hubs, the vendor ecosystem is evolving. So there are very interesting hybrid models emerging. One has continued to see a flux between insourcing and outsourcing where we are seeing if someone had to set up a center in today's environment, you have the opportunity to do it very differently from how you would have done it even five years ago. You have yeah. the opportunity to leverage technology at, as a core at the backbone and leverage a very sophisticated vendor ecosystem, a startup ecosystem to do things in a very, very different way. Uh, sure. So with that, I, I will pause there. Uh, I will chime in with a few examples, but uh, we'll live come in a very different you. world. I'll come back to you, Vishaldi, certainly. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting to hear from you about uh, uh, the entire uh, expanded form of GCC. Uh, we, re we, we recall uh, vividly that uh, the middle C, which uh, for some time meant captive, was also not liked by many people and then captive gave way to uh, capabilities. Earlier, we used to call them global in-house centers and all those things. So very interesting. We'll come back to you. Uh, we uh, have this uh, the important point associated with some of the comments being heard around this entire uh, uh, remote working and home working and whatnot uh, about the concept of uh, data security, data privacy, and all that. And I will turn to you, Sajesh, for your perspectives on that front. Uh, you bring strong uh, technology capabilities uh, through UST and all that. And so how do you see this particular part? What has been your experience? Have there been any situations that uh, we acted in? We might have, some people might have acted in hast and uh, made a small little compromises here and there, but we haven't heard any big uh, 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 sort of disaster around that. So what has been your experience? How has been that response? And how do you see going forward? Yeah, so, uh, you know, see, I think uh, the, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having the opportunity to be here uh, with this esteemed panel. And in fact, it was a great to hear Ravi talk about uh, some of the, uh, you know, the thinking around uh, how this whole thing is evolving and the, the previous panel as well. And uh, in fact, this is a, a conversation. We, you know, Deepak, you, you, we, we talked about it yesterday as well. The the point is, uh, yes, data security is important, uh, but the, the organizations have evolved quite quite well for uh, during this pandemic, right? So there are technology advancements there where you can actually uh, look at, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of uh, remote working kind of procedures can be established. So, so technology has really helped in achieving those kind of objectives on remote working environments. And many organizations, uh, you know, see so even if you look at UST uh, ourselves, right? Uh, we went through uh, a, a, a pseudo pandemic uh, uh, during, if you look at it, we have a major operations in Kerala, uh, in Southern India. And we had floods uh, two years back uh, before this pandemic hit, right? And we have to, evolve our thinking around what could have happened in a remote working scenario because there is no choice. I mean, it's floods and uh, we have to take care of that. And that helped us to evolve our business to think about what, what does it mean that if another pandemic hits, what do you need to do? And that has really helped us to uh, establish remote working environment in a very, very short amount of time. In fact, we were up and running in 48 hours, uh, which was, you know, everybody thought, okay, you know, you're just joking but it is quite possible. And more importantly, if you look at uh, part of the problem before this pandemic was, while that data security and all those elements were there, many organization was looking at it from a paper standpoint, right? They were not really practically thinking about it. And what this pandemic has done is, you know, it is like, uh, uh, you know, adversity is the mother of invention. Uh, people have no choice but to think about whether it's really true or not. And they, a lot of the DR processes, a lot of the uh, business continuity processes started stress testing, right? And that's when a lot of the technology investments that has gone in uh, has really helped organizations to shape 
and even take say for example deepak uh, we were talking yesterday about there are capabilities like you can scan emails you can you know you can pretty much protect your data far better in a remote environment nowadays with the help of technology and people have started using that quite effectively right earlier it was more kind of pilots going on uh, because you know there was no need for it and there was uh, less of an importance given to those points now what this has done is actually this giving more focus around that and it will continue to stay, stay right that is uh, that is the beauty of this that it has accelerated some of these focus around data security and other elements and it become more live as opposed to be on a paper so that's how i see it uh, so definitely technology existed but uh, it is now becoming practical in in my view uh, deepak you want to add something to that i know that you have some views the i think one of the key things is technology was always there and i think we were planning i mean the disruption in the technology space was going on it wasn't it didn't stop i think there was a lot of curiosity a lot of new ideas a lot of new uh, you know tools and techniques that came up over the last 5 7 years and i think the gics or gccs the, whichever name you call them with have been using that but i think one of the things that has happened now is the acceleration what has happened now is that we have suddenly started realizing the importance of all of these tools and accelerated our journey of adoption so if, if you really talk about it 5 years ago we had all these tools you know the e invoicing was there the ocrs were there the all technologies were pretty much prevalent and the adoption levels were at 20 30 40% <laughs> one disruption like the pandemic suddenly takes your adoption level from 20% to an 85 90% and all of this happens in in a short period of 2 to 3 months because as shadesh pointed out necessity the mother of all invention you don't have an alternate mechanism to get yourself paid so all the resistance that was there just faded away i think one of the key things that this pandemic has taught us is that it's not about uh building something new i think it's a human quest always goes on keeps on discovering new things and as a as a human species you know we keep on our curiosity doesn't allow us to you know uh, reduce our effort on on any of these areas you know we constantly try to innovate constantly try to find out new things but a, a situation like pandemic suddenly brings a point of inflection in our adoption and in our approach towards this entire thing i think the agility with which all of us re responded to it first of all we responded to it because we wanted to stay we wanted to survive otherwise the business as usual won't work so all of that say for example in our case you know we are a financial services company most of the trade deals that happen with us is electronic and trading needs to happen from our centers barring some of those things which are statutory or regulatory in perspective everybody found out a mechanism of working from home and all of these operations were set up within 48 hours I mean, I could never imagine two years ago that we are shifting desktops home. Yeah. No, it was a big no-no. Can you imagine somebody taking an asset like a desktop home and still be able to connect things, connect to the servers, connect to all the places, and very easily work on it, and no incidents, not a single incidents of data storage, data leakage, or any other sort of data privacy issue. How did you manage all of this? i think all of this happened because we were forced to do it and that's the that's the distinction that i want to draw between disruptions that have been happening voluntarily or in controlled environment or through our own uh, phases of discovery and the second this this is a disruption that was forced upon us and we reacted differently i think this is past us now mm. we need to look at this again again goes back to the main topic of this discussion that we have created some sort of velocity whether it's good enough as escape velocity or not i we are not sure as it, at this point of time but definitely there is a velocity there is a momentum that has been created it is now time to look forward as to what we do with all of this that has happened and how do we use this for the future i think that's the question yeah so we'll come back to that on uh, how to uh, 
accelerate this velocity and momentum to really reach that escape level and not remain uh, content with what we have, how we have responded or how okay. we are. Uh, I will now turn to Sean, uh, who has joined us all the way from uh, Dallas, uh, early morning time. Sean, we are uh, really thankful to you. Uh, and uh, you uh, had this situation in the middle of various other things which were no so, uh, not short of any uh, turbulence by itself, and then this uh, whole thing hit. So how did you manage it, and what are your key messages for going forward? Yes. Um, can you hear me okay, Anand? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us, or th thanks for having me and the, the rest of the panelists. It's a really, really interesting discussion. Um, first of all, I work for Alcon, so global uh, leader in eye care. And we, we, we had a spinoff from Novartis in um, 2019. But 2020 was really targeted as our, our major effort to uh, separate from the company. So... Uh, we, and what that means is we spent, uh, we spent about three, seven, eight years integrating into Novartis and we had two years to separate from Novartis. And this is global network infrastructure systems, uh, ERP, everything. So we had a pretty heavy mandate in 2020 to actually execute this worldwide. Not to mention we had to set up a new IT organization, new service centers as well, everything from scratch. Um, and, and so we had an aggressive agenda, but the, uh, then the pandemic hit and during, during the, uh, our agenda for, uh, 2020 was also to shift our sourcing model. Um, so, uh, and I really appreciate what, uh, Shalini had said about the definition of a service center. The, when we, we sat back as a new company and uh, a global company, about seven, seven billion dollar company, we said, what do we want our service centers to be? So we had the opportunity to rethink. And we went down the path of what uh, Shalini was saying, where the service centers are actually another delivery arm as part of our global team. We don't look to them as a separate unit that is independent and delivers services independently. They're really part of our global team. Um, and that was a very, very strategic uh, move. As you know, we could, we could have gone a lot of different ways with that and just created services and such. But we, we said no. Uh, for instance, IT, my, my department is responsible for global services and the individuals in the service center are just part of the team, part of that global team. Uh, and, and we also said we're going, going to make a shift. So under our prior company, under Novartis, we were about, I would say, 70 70 to 80% outsourced, particularly with technology, the technical competence and expertise. In 2020, we targeted, let's make that shift. Let's shift to a model that we're about 20 to 30% outsourced. And the majority of our technical know-how will be built up in the delivery centers, particularly the one in India. So we had a massive recruiting effort also taking place in 2020. Uh, the, and the, uh, the pandemic hit, and we had to set, say, what do we do now? Do we set back and put these on hold and continue on with our vendors? And, we, and our, our new team in, in India and our leaders there with the delivery centers said, no, we can push on. So like some of you said, we can, we're, we're going to uh, take advantage now of the situation and push on. Um, so we did, and we had a very successful hiring uh, thanks to the, the, the teams, uh, our leaders in, in India. Uh, hiring of our, uh, and we hit our recruiting targets and and I'm really, really proud to say that the feedback I got from the, from the individuals uh, that were hired are that it was some of the best onboarding experience they've ever had with any company. Uh, and, I, and, it, and I think it's, an, a, a tri it's attributed to rethinking. We no longer, we had to think about how do we engage this new talent coming in? How do we engage them and make them part of that team? Uh, and I remember some of our leaders in the company said, the pandemic has actually led to a flattening of the organization, not the, not the org chart, but the organization and the ability for anybody to talk to anybody at any time, uh, no matter where you are in the, uh, in the organization. And, and 
and I see that reflected in the, in the new individuals hired on where I've had conversations with them personally. I said, hey, just ping me now on our new platforms on Teams and I'll get on a WebEx with you and we'll have a chat. Uh, whereas historically it would have been wait for, wait for me to take the trip to India and then we'll have that conversation. So it's really flat new organization. Uh, so we hit the hiring goals and such. And we also took the opportunity like you had uh, said, Anand, to, to deploy technology even faster. And, and whereas we could have said, oh my God, how are we going to get this done? Because we can't go face to face with uh, our global partners around the world to deploy SAP, to deploy new, uh, uh, new laptops to 20 some thousand associates. We said, no, we're going to do it remotely. Um, and we actually exceeded our schedule in doing that uh, because we took a, a, a advantage of the opportunity uh, and in doing that, uh, and not even thinking about this, we bid, built credibility with the rest of the business, this new business, on what IT can do, and also what can we do working together. Um, I didn't mention also, we started a business transformation at the same time as well, internally. Uh -huh. So multiple factors going on, and part of that business transformation was a digital transformation. So now we have a new team, global, the, and our service centers are part of that team. And we said, we're, we're building an Asia-based Asia digital solution. And what do we do? Typically, when you do an agile team, the agile team all works together. We can't work together. Uh, we can't be sitting face-to-face -face at an agile scrum table. Um, and so we broke the agile models and said, we're going to have a global agile team that's spread across five continents. Uh, and we actually built the product. You know, and uh, the majority of the delivery was out of our certain new brand new service team in India. And we delivered that product on time, actually a little bit ahead of time um, at remarkable speed with uh, the combination of internal and, and external staff, which we would have never been able, I don't think we've been able to do it before. Um, so we built the confidence also to move on. So it's a, a few factors where we've really leveraged to not only transform the business, transform the relationship, flatten the organization, uh, but also set us up for what's new. We've built the eagerness to say, oh my gosh, we could do this. What else can we do now as working as one global, global team tightly integrated with the business? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, it's so reassuring to hear those thoughts and your experiences, uh, uh, which came all in the middle of multiple things happening as you rightly pointed out. And, uh, also heartening to note that uh, this has really worked for you, uh, including the India experience. Uh, coming to India and uh, turning now to Samba, uh, one of the uh, elements of the new normal that we often hear, read about, and sometimes even experience is that the fast depleting uh, consumer loyalties. The consumer had never had it so good in terms of the choices and the ease with which he or she can shift uh, among those choices. In that backdrop, uh, how did your organization, that is Tata Sky, uh, deal with the, the turbulence and how do you propose to move forward from here? Some key nuggets from you, please. Yeah. Thanks, Anand, and uh, thanks uh, again for... Uh... Uh, inviting me as part of this forum. Uh, actually, I feel uh, that uh, all the important topics I think has been covered uh, between Shalini and uh, Sajesh and uh, Shavan and uh, uh, also Deepak. So, so it's good. So, what I can I can uh, spend the next say maybe three four minutes uh, is on uh, Tata Sky is as as most of you may be knowing it's a DTH uh, company. Uh, we have been in existence for about fifteen years now, and uh, uh, we are. A highly a customer focused company uh, which i think people know so our main uh, objective when pandemic struck uh, was to make sure that there is no customer disruption while disruption within the organization is acceptable uh, for us it was not acceptable to have a disruption in services to the customer so that is what uh, all our energies were focused on uh, around march 15th uh, we had a session internally uh, to see that, okay, if there is a lockdown, uh, what would we do? So that was something, a uh, great foresight uh, of our managing director, Harit Nagpal. So we were kind of uh, prepared when the actual lockdown announcement was made around, I think, 23rd or 24th of uh, March. And uh, we had prepared a plan 
as to what we said as a contingency plan uh, as to who are the people who are going to work in the office how many people will be there which office uh, how do we make arrangement for their stay so that all the customer impacting uh, work for example the technology team where the uh, network operation center was working the it team where there are critical services we wanted it to be clear that there is no disruption uh, from the customer point of view so that is uh, point number 1 so to that extent we were kind of prepared so when the actual lockdown announcement came at 8 8 o'clock or 8:30 the previous evening saying that from tomorrow uh, it will be a national lockdown uh, we had to just activate uh, uh, that particular uh, plan so to say and second point i would like to mention is that uh, this actually helped us this pandemic actually helped us to test our digital transformation journey what uh, the company was going through over the last 7 years so so we had started this transformation journey about in 2013 14 where we were trying to move a lot of things into digital mode and one by one by one lot of small small things from the customer perspective from the finance perspective from sales perspective lots of i'm not getting into the details but we were doing lot of projects so to say so all these things came into fruition i'll just touch upon one particular example uh when uh, we started at least when i started in the company in 2013 the customers used to make payments uh, for uh, their recharges and about uh, i think 20 to 25% of the payments were coming through uh, uh, what we call as the online mode the remaining 75% was offline after demonetization this went up to 40% because uh, immediately on demonetization the cash crunch happened and people started moving into online it moved to 40% and it was slowly hovering around 50% uh, around march 2020 so immediately after lockdown when people could not go out how do they watch television uh, sitting at home uh, if they don't have an opportunity to go out they had to adopt to online mechanism so we reached around 80% from 50% uh, within a span of a couple of weeks so that puts a lot of pressure on the system process everything right you have not seen that kind of a volume growth uh, for the back end system to really see whether it works there is a 60% increase in volume overnight 50 to 80 right so that is something uh, which uh, so that's why i was saying that whatever automation we had done it was a kind of a test uh, which was done which was this pandemic and uh, i thought that uh, we came out with a reasonable uh, kind of success out of this pandemic and the second point where we were not so successful is around the uh, what we call as the management of the outsourced agencies most of our call, this in call centers like this is a we have a few million customers and uh, there are a few call centers uh, through outsourced agencies where the customers can make the calls and we make the calls to the customers on a daily basis we are talking about uh, more than a, a few lakhs of calls every single day so those people they need to also be fully automated that part we were not so ready so it took a while for us maybe i think two weeks or three weeks for us to get the operating centers ready so to that extent we were negatively impacted by pandemic because when the customers were making the calls and the call centers were non operational because of the lockdown there was nobody to pick up the call so naturally our abandoned call rate went up to as high as say 70 75% when our norm was 2% our norm was 2% whereas it reached 75% overnight like that 50% went to 80% this abandoned call also went up overnight right so that we had to bring it down it took us uh, maybe a couple of months to bring back to the normal level so there we had a big challenge so that is something which we were kind of not, not prepared for so we had a success story where we had a learning as well so with yeah. these two points uh, yeah i will i will kind of stop no 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 i i would say that the learning story is uh, equally if not more powerful Yeah. That you, uh, uh, you very well anticipated a few things, planned around that, and executed that plan. But yeah. your partner system or your ecosystem could not uh, deal with that influx of those incremental calls uh, immediately, and that took some time. So these yeah. are all. Uh, this is a very important sharing of a, a yeah. so-called uh, learning also. Yeah. But uh, uh, great to hear from you, Samba. And there is a question uh, from an audience. Uh, you may like to have a look at it and time permitting we'll come back to it otherwise yeah, yeah, sure. everyone respond thank okay. you thank you uh, i will turn uh, again to uh, shalini on an important point that uh, you made about some interesting 
operating models emerging, balancing between insourcing, outsourcing, carve out and all that. Maybe you may want to elaborate some of that in a GCC context and it will be useful if you can also contextualize it uh, in terms of whether we are talking of the very matured kind of GCCs, the larger ones with the, uh, you know, when I say large ones means uh, upward of thousand uh, headcount uh, in that uh, uh, offshore model, uh, or there are many of them which are uh, much smaller. So uh, how has been your experience uh, 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 on that side of uh, the uh, spectrum? Uh, and how are they responding? And what is you see that uh, they are using the turbulence to a new normal for themselves, which is the best for them in the next year or two? Sure, sure, Ananda. I'll try and kind of give maybe through a few examples. But when we look at, like I said, you know, in the last 10 months, if I just look at conversations we've been having, uh, the number of conversations with the global onshore teams has just been uh, much more frequent and significant, whereas as everyone's kind of stepping back to look at their service delivery model to figure out whether it is really fit for purpose. Uh, when I say that, I mean, it's parallel to all of the wider organization-wide transformation, the digitalization program that organizations have been uh, in that journey for a few years. Like we've all said, the pandemic kind of uh, accelerated a few things, but it's been a good time to step back and take stock. Uh, for some sectors that were specifically reeling uh, under the pressure of, you know, how the pandemic hit their core business, uh, costs and optimization became quite uh, the need of the hour. And hence the need to really look at whether the model today stacks up in the context of, of all of that. Um, and a lot of uh, organizations have, have done this differently. And if I call out a few examples of things we've been seeing, uh, one is, for example, on the back of the cost pressure, the opportunity to step back and figure which of your processes do, are absolutely core and do you want to keep within? And are there some areas which are not as core to you, which you believe there is a service provider who can do it for you in a much more effective manner? So we've seen the whole managed services model uh, come back into the forefront. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some large deals that have been announced on the back of carve outs and acquisitions that the big tech players have made, taking over the entire IT uh, infrastructure, device management, applications management. So there is some of that. And to that extent, there clearly has been an opportunity to review your vendor landscape and outsourcing opportunity. That, that's, that's one example of what we're seeing. Uh, at another level, those that have been a little more mature on their digitalization journey have also seen the opportunity to now actually bring a few things back in-house because what was outsourced five, 10 years ago, today the environment in which you can operate those same processes with, where you're leveraging a tech platform allows you to actually bring that back in-house and hence uh, address a bunch of other risks potentially that uh, the regulatory environment poses. And there have also been a whole bunch of insourcing deals that we're seeing. The interesting part is insourcing deals doesn't anymore mean headcount moving from vendor back in-house. But like I said, the very nature and model in which those processes are being done are very different. And that's yeah. the trigger for some of that insourcing. So that could be a, a second example that uh, I'd like to call out. Uh, the, the third example that uh, comes to mind when you look at these uh, operating models is also how you are leveraging the vendor ecosystem from a startup perspective. Again, accelerators, incubators, mushroomed all over the place. To be honest, uh, one needs to look at it closely to see how many of those were truly effective in terms of outcomes that they uh, got to, how successful and sustainable were those cohorts and some of those accelerator programs. But the fact is that now we are seeing some of the uh, GCCs actually use partners in their in the startup world to build some very innovative platforms uh, to really change the way of working, to change the models of working, and uh, and hence I go back to the point to say that you know when you look at the world today, we are working with a few organizations who are going through a very interesting exercise, which they call a zero waste exercise, to say. Yeah. 
we may have been in in this business and may have had a center operational for the last 10 15 years but why don't we step back and look at if we had to set up shop today and set this model up today how different would that look and yeah. honestly i think that's a great exercise to go through because the world around you has changed the not just what technology allows you but what uh, what the vendor and the wider ecosystem allows you. So it's a fantastic opportunity to step back and reflect on how would you do things differently? Yeah. We've known of organizations who've been in the country for a long time with 15, 20,000 people in some sense through the vendor network, through outsourced models who are now coming in and saying, we want to set up our own center, but guess what? We're going to do it very differently. Here's what our center is going to do. I'm going to create a digital hub. I'm going to set up an innovation hub. These are the three or four things that my center will do while I continue to use the vendor model for all else. So uh, there are a whole host of interesting models emerging, Anand, on the back of some of these dynamics. And hence, a great time to step back and look at if you did things today afresh, how would you do that very differently? Because there are some really new, interesting ideas and models there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charlie. That's much helpful. Uh, before I move on, uh, there is a poll coming up. Uh, I would request the host to uh, put up the poll here and request uh, everyone, including a panelist and the audience, to try and respond to the most important ingredient required to build a healthy, anti-fragile organization for the future would be. Fifteen seconds more, please. Kindly submit your choice. Your all are nice descriptions, good choices. Which appeals to you most? Please pick that up. Okay, we can close the poll, please. And uh, I would uh, come back with the uh, poll results after the next question, which is for Sajesh. Uh, uh, Sajesh, uh, as we have already heard, and Shalini also touched upon it, it is not necessarily about just one company, how uh, it responds to a particular situation and creates opportunity out of it. It is about the whole ecosystem. And how do you see that the entire ecosystem that we operate in is gearing up to attain that kind of escape velocity going forward when it comes to digital transformation? Uh, is it uh, uh, how comprehensive you can make it and how much outcome focused uh, 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 that program, entire program you can make out of it? Uh, uh, what's your sense? What are your experiences around? Yeah, so, um, you know, so again, um, I think Shadley touched upon it uh, earlier. Um, so if I look at it, you know, we are focused on intelligent automation and it is becoming a very hot topic and a, a key pillar for digital transformation, right, across the board. Uh, but if, if you take a step back, you, you know, the natural tendency would be to say that, look, th there is advancement in technology. You have the best artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, you know, NLP technologies, et cetera, deliver. But what, what is shaping this ecosystem and uh, is, if you look at, you know, if I take a step back and think about what happened during the pandemic, okay, even though these technologies existed, one big shift is happening is the collaboration between business and technology groups have been, uh, you know, it's it's one of the best so far during the pandemic, right? Because earlier when we used to go to a business leader, the natural tendency was, oh, it is technology piece, you can talk to our technology teams. But today that is not the case. You know, they will say, no, 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 no. I want to hear what, what you're going to do because it is impacting business operation day to day and I need to be involved on a day to day basis, right? So that's a big shift. That collaboration has really shifted the thinking. And what 
a, a what do you call it a side effect of that or a, a positive side effect of that is what people realize is in order to drive value faster you know you need to have an ecosystem so that that word itself started thinking about because you can't invent at the pace that you needed to invent today with just you know having a few uh, people within your own team thinking about it right so that is definitely has opened up doors of possibilities people are people are more receptive to uh, ideas people are receptive to startups uh, than ever before and that is happening quite rapidly because you know the, the because that collaboration is actually driving saying that why can't we do it uh, within a month why can't you know so shalini mentioned about it earlier right uh, the entire digital transformation ask has transformed from five years to one year and that is also because and again we need to understand the why right so if you look at earlier sumit was talking about if you look at retail you know online grocery shopping used to exist uh, but that would have been maybe 5% of your business or 10% of the business suddenly it became 40% of your business so you need to change and in, in fact samba was saying earlier suddenly everybody is uh, reaching uh, you know reaching out in a digital way you suddenly became 50% became 80% right from a digital adoption so you need to change at a very very rapid pace and that requires an ecosystem to come together very rapidly right that's very that was one important thing the second thing that we started seeing a shift which is again enabling that ecosystem is to look at uh, value creation as the paramount as opposed to getting getting hung hung up on technology itself right so people started looking at more kind of that value creation in a more holistic fashion so that that is what is enabling to think about you know what uh, you know i don't need to build everything myself i can bridge the gap uh, with uh, a, a compelling um, technology to enable me to act faster right so that's why a uh, lot of those uh, technology adoptions you see and, and we are seeing that uh, intelligent automation pieces right one of the big ask for, from our side was not about individual components it mm. was about an intelligent orchestration of those components right that became the major shift right because intelligent components existed but how do you weave that together and that's where we need to get collaboration and bring a lot of the other technologies also in in play and th that's how we sh see the shift happening and one more point to sh uh, extend to what shalini was saying from a gcc standpoint what we are seeing is historically people will use it okay you know what let's drive labor arbitrage let's look at more efficiency uh, and then we will think about technology now that is shifting people are looking at because the data is available the digital ways of working is available they are thinking about process reengineering and automation then looking at uh, you know kind of outsourcing and things like that so what is important to understand uh for you know again business partners who are in this uh, call and the audience who are managing gccs are looking at uh, uh, you know uh, gccs is a lot of the strategic work that used to happen at the mothership is slowly shifting towards the gccs right so you are the talents upskilling become much more you know so you are working on much more what do you call it what is called as a higher value activities more and more and that requires this upskilling of talents and that also creates a lot of new possibilities for all the talent that is there so that's something to think about and uh, yeah. that's how thank we see that evolution uh, thank you thank you very much sajesh you have made some very compelling points uh, uh, before i turn back to you sean uh, let me check if we have the poll results uh, handy ah there they come okay ah i am sure you can all uh, read it uh, creating an environment to allow free imagination takes the cake here but uh, other than that i think uh, people have given a uh, good spread of importance to other factors as well a robust intelligent automation infrastructure is another uh, big factor uh, 
So thank you very much. Uh, this was an uh, interesting insight from an uh, overall uh, uh, audience point of view. Uh, so uh, Sean, you heard a uh, lot of things coming from uh, Sajesh in terms of uh, how the GCCs in particular have uh, uh, need to respond and create an ecosystem around that. What has been uh, your experience and what are more importantly, what are your plans uh, to uh, accelerate this uh, uh, digital uh, transformation to escape, uh, to reach those escape velocity levels. Yes, yes. Um, the, and please be brief. We have uh, just about five minutes. Okay, well, um, I, I love the poll because the, the imagination thing is key for me. The, uh, what I love about uh, what happened last year is it really changed the risk posture of the company and risk posture of individuals. And what we are doing is enabling that imagination, imagination thinking. We've actually put objectives in, in individuals, personal objectives last year that they have to uh, basically go out and learn new technologies uh, and do that on their own even and explore and then take that and leverage it in the en enterprise. I'm amazed on how difficult it is to change that culture. Okay, so we really, really have to press in on it that it's okay. It's okay to take that risk now. And um, we want you to take that risk. We want you to learn new and we want you to implement in the environment. If you fail, it's okay. We'll learn from that and then continue to move on. Um, that's a big one for us. I, I want to be brief uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and turn it back to you. But I think that's, no, no, I can speak you. more about our plans, but I want to allow time for those. No, no, no. We uh, we will come back to you one, for one more, uh, one probably one last question, either from the audience. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, turn to you, Deepak, again. Uh, you have a fantastic view, uh, not only at the global GCC levels that is scale, but also very much large Indian corporations. How they have leveraged this entire uh, global process consolidation mechanism. And uh, so given that kind of uh, uh, depth of uh, your uh, experiences, width of your experiences, both, uh, how would you uh, visualize some of the stuff coming forward to us in terms of people behavior and leadership behavior uh, uh, to achieve that escape velocity in the field of business services? I think it's a great question, Anand. Two things I I want to just I'll I'll, I'll just uh, make my point with two examples. Somewhere around 2018, 19, uh, you know, when the rest of the world was going towards consolidation of operations, my current organization, Edelweiss, hired me to really break open an existing shared services and give it back to various organizations. <laughs> so we were we were a large group shared service center, and in 2018 we started our journey to make it smaller, faster, in terms of being more agile and more technology oriented, and then enable each of the businesses to run it themselves rather than a large corporate organization running it. It had many more strategic requirements, so to speak, you know, the regulatory part of it, and also the, you know, the, the corporate structure that we were trying to get into, and also the cost of, you know, where do we want to keep our capital, you know, as a holding company, do you want to invest in a shared services organization, or you want to keep investing in assets that pay you back as a financial services organization, these were some of the bigger questions that were there in front. So one of the biggest asks was to really start this process from a leadership perspective, I think, it was important for a leader to have a view about what they want to do with their GBS organization. And that's very important because that's the summon, you know, that's the crux in which, uh, that's, that's the backbone of all operations, you know, because whether it's uh, custodial operations or whether it is broking operations or whether it is your banking operations or whether it's loans, mortgages, I think everything culminated into a shared services operation. So I think that was a very important call that the company took. And it was a very strategic call that the company took. But having taken that call, I think we had, what, what was happening was while we were planning this journey of the technological changes, 
I think this came like a bolt from the blue. You know, we were not planning a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> no one was. So no we did not know how to react. Whether we really continue with our journey. Last January, we were, I, you know, we were having a very important discussion. Should we continue our journey or should we start looking at BAU? I think BAU took more, you know, precedence over uh, the you know, our journey in transformation. But it was not more than a month, month and a half before which we said we will be back into our fold. And then exactly that's that's what was important for us to get. We were able to uh, kickstart all our projects again, and I'm telling you, this is this is almost like eight to nine months after when we started out the projects. Today we have absolutely taken away all our processes, put into the new technology, and handed them back to our businesses. Wonderful. We have sort of had a reversal of sorts as far as our technology. So instead of one large center, we have created centers of excellence layered with great deal of technology and customer right in so this is this is not a back office anymore the front office and the back office the lines between the front office and the back office is blurred for us yep. you know so that's the most important thing that has happened here and it's a different kind of a transformation altogether Absolutely. what did, how did pandemic help us in this entire thing was that acceleration was the key it first stopped us, but then at the same time, it also made sure that once we have started the journey, we couldn't see back. There was no point in going back to where we were. We said, right or wrong, failure or success, we don't know. You know, We will fail maybe at the most what will happen, we'll fail. But we'll keep our plan B, but we'll move forward with our plan A. And that's what we achieved. You know, By end of the last year, we were able to close out on all the projects. Yeah. That's what I believe the uh, the literal meaning of velocity is the speed with direction. So the direction has to be there along with the speed. Uh, and uh, uh, wonderful to hear from that experience. Uh, uh, let me uh, turn this slightly differently. This uh, pandemic is not the only turbulence to, uh, that uh, many of us would have faced, uh, as you have also rightly pointed out. And uh, uh, Samba, you are, you are in the middle of uh, your business is in the middle of something where OTT over the top is coming and every, it's gaining a lot more traction in the marketplace, maybe starting on a, a small base and many other interesting things happening. So uh, uh, how are you gearing up uh, for this part of the future? You narrated very beautifully what you planned in March of 2020 that you could put in place uh, within hours of uh, the need arising, but uh, what next? Yeah, so it's a uh, it's a very good question. Actually, uh, uh, this OTT uh, uh, specifically is a big threat for us. There is no doubt about it in the long term, uh, but not uh, we don't see it as a threat because OTT has been here for the last say three four years. Uh, uh, Post COVID, uh, it has actually taken up, uh, taken off very, very fast. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, what you can say, Amazon Prime and Netflix and all the OTT players uh, doing phenomenal amount of uh, viewership and subscription. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, uh, this increase in the OTT viewership is not uh, seen along with the decrease in the television viewership. Okay. So, so fortunately is what I would say. So as we see in the last say nine months, uh, we have not seen a big decline or anything, even a small decline we have not seen. Because what we believe is happening is that people are uh, using OTT as an and. Barring a very few dash one, what you can say, the very city goers where it's uh, it's highly people like us, we used to say, uh, where we do the cord cutting. It's a technical term. What we say is cord cutting means that people move to OTT and cut the cord for uh, DTH basically. Uh -huh. Uh, but that is not happening, uh, uh, unlike in Western, because the economics don't uh, support that. Uh, in the Western world, uh, by cutting the cord, you save a lot of money, at least $40, $50 you save every month by cutting the cord. Mm. But here, by cutting the uh, cord, you will save maybe 2 $3. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense for people to cut the cord. And the cost of OTT is uh, anywhere around uh, 10 to $12. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so it's actually the equation is the other way around where OTT is actually more expensive uh, than DTH, uh, which is a phenomenon, uh, which is the reason why it's an and. So therefore, uh, we are not seeing a big, and we are also playing in a small way with binge, binge plus kind of products. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's expected to grow well. Uh, as of now, we are seeing some good traction on that as well. 
with that i'll stop thank you thanks thanks and i i personally feel that uh, cost is only one element but uh, the content uh, will ultimately decide where the viewership will finally yeah. wear around to so okay. i'm sure the uh, you know the uh, your own system ecosystem behind you uh, has to respond faster to it uh, for people like you to uh, stay afloat and thrive okay yeah. so uh, yeah. with that more or less uh, we are uh, covered our time uh, uh, i wish we could continue this fantastic exchange of ideas thoughts learnings experiences uh, crystal ball gazing into the future a little bit although that's very very risky but uh, still it's interesting so thank you very very much for uh, uh, being with us uh, the, the there are there may be still one or two questions that we could not take up you may kindly uh, respond to those if they have been addressed to anyone individually and i would request you all to stay behind for few minutes more that uh, this evening is going to witness a very very important part of shared services forums annual conclave uh, that is recognition felicitation and award presentation 